Ed O'Brien. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very well. It's good to uh, good to see you. Thank you for coming in for Beats One London. We're going to do the five best songs on Apple Music. You have a record coming out as well, yep. April the 17th. It's yep. called Earth. Yes. I get the impre- impression, having played a bunch of songs from it on the show so far, having listened to the whole thing as well, that this is something that you wanted to do personally and felt like you had to do rather than it be suggested to you that you do a solo album, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I, there's no need for myself to make a solo record. I, I felt no pressure or, you know, I'm in Radiohead and that's taken up a lot of time and a lot of creativity. And for me, the whole process has been completely actually by surprise. The songs start to emerge and coming out and I felt the pull of them and suddenly it was just like, okay, I need to record these right and then... I need to get the best musicians I can on this. And then it's like, I want to release it. And then it's, I want to tour this. So it's not been a, I need to do this or it's, I have to do this. And why now? Why didn't that happen before, do you think? I don't know. I mean, I mean, part of it's, I think, down to family. You know, when my kids were born, I was very, very adamant that I wanted to be a present and hands-on father. And with the amount of time that radio took up, any spare time, any other time, I wanted to be around my kids, and my wife. So it wasn't until they got a little bit older that suddenly there was some time. It's funny, it's like I, I've got insecurities about it because like I'm 51 now and it's like, well, why are you doing this now? Because most people don't do this, but I'm just figuring that's part of the mystery and magic of music. Sometimes it's it happens to you, it doesn't make sense. All I know is that I've done one, I'm going to tour it, and I'm already thinking about the next one. And I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about this. It feels like a, feels like another life, really. The vibe that I get, there, there's two different sides to this record. Uh, there's one side which is very folky in a Led Zepp kind of way. Yeah. And then the other side, it kind of sounds like Glastonbury, yeah. going to Park Stage, yeah. Crow's Nest, or somewhere around there yeah. at kind of midday, one PM, when you just you get your first sight of all of these people, yeah. and you know that you're going to spend most of your weekend at the greatest festival on planet Earth yeah. in the best bit of that festival. Yeah, that's pretty good. And I would add the bit of Shangri La, like four o'clock in the morning, and maybe if there was a little bit of there was a corner of Shangri La that had like a a samba Brazilian carnival. I mean, that would be great because I'd spent time, we'd spent time in Brazil and that informed the, the record as well. Emily, Michael, yes. you're listening. <laughs> that would <laughs> be mental. We've had an idea. Um, yeah. Listen, that leads us very nicely onto uh, the first song that we're going to yeah. play. This is your five best songs on Apple Music. Yeah. Do you want to introduce this one for us? I was trying to think of songs that had a profound impact on me in different stages of my life. So some are pretty obvious, some aren't. But So the first one, a track called So Danzo Samba, Stan Getz and Joel Gilberto. It's off the first famous Getz Gilberto album, which is famous for the girl from Ipanema. For me, this was the track really where Brazilian music, I discovered it. And I, it was around the time of OK Computer, so about 97. And I wasn't in the best place. I know that might sound strange because seemingly the band was on top of the world, but... It was the music that I needed to hear and it started my love of Brazilian music. It was this slightly melancholic music that really came from the heart and this music conjured up this beautiful place for me to be in. I mean, if I'm able to listen to this properly, it's the track that will absolutely reduce me to tears. So we're playing some samba on Beats One. Mm. Did you cry during that, Ed? I didn't. Oh, <laughs> but given the right atmosphere I, I would guess. for sure yeah. isn't that amazing about music that it can it can reduce you to tears and it takes you to that place and that's that, that's one of the things about music isn't it and the way that also music holds memories I love that whole thing when you hear a track from 1985 and you go I know exactly and it takes You're you right back there. right back to yeah. how you felt at that time it's, it's amazing any songs that do that for you any any year in the 70s or kind of up until about 86 I'm like right back there <laughs> Has any of your own music that you've played on yeah. reduced you to tears? Maybe not tears, but I, I think, you know, the albums that you make that really resonate, the first time it happening in abundance was on OK Computer. I remember the, there were bits of the bends that were really affecting. I loved Planet Telex on that record. It was the way it opened up. It was kind of a big sort of emotional step, but... Then it was there in abundance. Certain takes, for instance, when we on OK Computer and recorded Let Down was a track that was essentially recorded live with a couple of overdubs. 
And that was a track that had this amazing emotional power to it. And that that felt very affecting. And then I think some of the stuff on In Rainbows feels really emotionally of that time. I wonder what it is. I wonder if it's the same thing that we mentioned about So Dance, So Samba, where there's a melancholic pull yeah. or a sadness to it. It's the sadness that I the think sadness affects and people the, in a way. Yeah, and there's the joy as well, that kind of sadness, but there's also joy and sadness. Yeah, and that, yeah, yeah. You know, that joy that you can have the two. You mentioned Brazil then, yeah. um, and you lived there for a while, right? Yeah. We, we, we went out there at the end of 2012, um, me and my young family, and we went to live in very, very rural Brazil. We lived on the edge of what they call the Macha Atlantica, which is the rainforest. Life was very, very simple. No Wi-Fi, no, no mobile, phone signal. And it was a proper, proper rural existence. How long were you there for? We were there for about six, seven months. Wow. And it was amazing. What I realized for, me, for my creative side, I need to be in the countryside. And that's where I really reconnected with, with life. And the existential stuff of... You know, you're in the wilds, you're in the elements. It, it, for some reason, it forces you to feel more about what it means to be a human being walking on this planet. You've got time to think about it. I like the fact that with you, I get the impression you, as a musician, are about feeling. Yeah. As opposed to technique. Yeah. Not saying that you don't have technique. Yeah, as a musician, it's interesting because, I mean, I'm self-taught. So if I have an Achilles heel, my insecurity is that I don't have the technique. I mean, it was lucky post-punk era growing up there. In Britain, most people were self-taught. Yeah. But I, I learned very early on in Radiohead that if you've got three guitarists, you can have the full-on assault, which we did in the early days. But actually, by not playing, you're contributing as much as when you are playing. Because you're deciding not to play. I think that a lot of space comes from what we've learned from dance music. You know, you, tracks are quite sparse yeah, definitely. in dance music, which does lead me nicely onto the next song that we're going to play, which is By Orbital, yeah. which I guess you would have heard when you were in Manchester, maybe? Yeah, I'm, and the reason I chose this was really to give an example of how important Acid House and the whole rave scene were. I was at Manchester University... I was so lucky. I was there from 1987 to 1990. So literally, literally, boom time. Yeah, Hacienda. boom. And also slightly pre-boom time as well. Um, in the summer of 89, what was going on in Manchester was like, it was it was like boom town, as you said. Did you bring it to Oxford? Well, yeah, because like in Oxford, <laughs> there was no night, there were no nightclubs. And so we hired this, I did rather, I hired this uh, room above this pub called the Cape of Good Hope in Oxford put on this club called the Justice Club. Tom used to help me out. He used to, I paid him to hulk the PA around and, <laughs> really? and do a bit of DJing. We both did some DJing, I think. So that whole era was so magical. And I remember this friend of mine, he got this new turntable and he said, do you want to check out this track? And I think it was like 1990, I think it was like April or something. And he put on Chime by Orbital. And that piece of music, the notes, it just sums up that whole era so beautifully. It's such an incredible piece of music. It's the sound of that time to me. It's a signpost song. It's, a, it's an important song and it leads people in, into that world yeah. deeper as well. It's great. Let's play it now. Okay. This is Orbital and it's Chime. Came out in 1989 originally. We're here with Ed O'Brien, yeah. uh, who's talking all things Earth, which is his solo album. It comes out in April, talking Radiohead, talking about doing uh, club nights in Oxford when yeah. you were about 20 years old, where yeah. you would have played Chime by Orbital, which yeah. you just heard. Talking about you and, and playing guitar, who were your favourite guitarists, people you had posters on the wall and that kind of thing of growing up? Well, I didn't have posters on the wall, but there would have been bands like, obviously, Johnny Marr and the Smiths. Mm. With Johnny was a big, big influence. I think the first guitarist where I sort of awoke to the guitar as an instrument was Andy Summers from The Police, mm. Walking on the Moon. When I heard that, that was a bit of a eureka moment because it was like, what's that sound? This music, this whole music sounds like it was recorded on the moon. Then there was, The Edge was a massive influence from U2. His stuff was amazing so many great guitarists coming out of the uk in the 70s and 80s they there? were so inventive marco peroni yeah, who, yeah, who yeah. was with adam and the ants he was a great great it was that whole i love that whole era when guitarists were trying not that you know no one was bending notes no one was trying to play the blues it was all about sounds and and textures and great riffs and how could you make the the guitar sound not like a guitar and put it in like a four minute 
pop song, if you like. Which is not too dis dissimilar from what you and Johnny do, and Tom as well, yeah. in Radiohead. Yeah, we were very lucky because we sort of had the, the best inspiration and they definitely informed us. And, you know, being in Radiohead has been fantastic because you can experiment and experimentation with sound and sonics is where we're at. Mm. And also we live through an era of guitar pedals and sonic, you know, expansion. There's so much stuff out there now. And, you know, 20 years ago, there wasn't that much stuff. There's too much stuff now. <laughs> Brian Eno has this expression, I think, of like, he would work out the cost of, you know, when he got a new piece of equipment, like back in the 80s, whether it was a Yamaha DX7, he would figure out whether he was going to buy something was also the time invested because it wasn't enough to go to the presets. You had to go to the sub-levels. Right. You had to really get into it. <laughs> you and had to make your own yeah, preset. Yeah, and he yeah, did yeah, exactly yeah. that with the DX7. And it's so true, in order to get really great sounds or new sounds, you have to go deep on these things. And I think if there's one criticism that I have of a lot of modern music, and I think it's the same as that people are very happy with what they get given. Get given on yeah, the plug-in. Yeah, yeah. And that m makes for a certain type of music. And I, you know, I get it. It's easy. You get the res you get your track yeah, out quicker. Yeah, but you quicker. don't have to do that. You can no. go further in. It's I, interesting that you say that. Yeah. What was it like the first time that you met Edge? Oh, it was very embarrassing because, you know, I was a bit drunk. So I was like, oh, I've got to tell you, man. <laughs> I fucking love. I can't tell you how much Unforgettable. You know, Unforgettable Fire was a massive, massive <laughs> record for me. And we were traveling on their bus. It was back in 97. And I just should have kept my mouth shut. But when you meet your heroes, I want to tell them how much I love and appreciate what they've done because their music is like life and death to me. So I was a bit o OTT with the edge. And, you know, he's a very lovely man. Was he cool with it? Yeah, I think so. I was drunk. I was uh, with... Maybe he was cool with it to your face and then he went to like one of you two security I know. guards like, get that guy away from me. <laughs> I don't ever want to see that guy again. Let's <laughs> play Let's play this track because you yeah. have chosen a, a yeah. track from Unforgettable Fire. But it's, this is a live version, right? Which would have been a B-side or something. Yeah. I mean, you two are this huge, huge band, right? And I don't think people recognize really how pioneering in sound they were in the early days. And I wanted to choose something from The Unforgettable Fire because it came at a period in my life as, a mu you know, I was just starting out playing and I heard this record and it blew my mind. There's a lot of layers to it. You know, you can hear, it was the first album they did with Lanoir and Eno mm. and you can hear the textures, you can hear the ambience and it's a track called Bad, which is on the record and I think they actually do a better version of it live. Mm. You know, what Edge plays on the guitar is, it's very minimal, but it's extraordinary. Let's yeah. play it now. This, I think, this is some research. I think this was recorded at Soundcheck in Birmingham at the NEC Arena in 1984. And it's it's on the Wide Awake in America, really. And it's on Wide Awake in America, wow. which is an EP, uh, which had some, I guess you call them B sides. Yeah, came out and a they're great B sides. And uh, yeah, so this is U2 and Bad live from 1984. We're here with Ed O'Brien talking about the five best songs on Apple Music. Just played a live version of Bad uh, by U2, which is, uh, the original is on Unforgettable Fire. That version is taken from Wide Awake in America, an EP. You were talking just then about kind of being in awe of Edge when you first met him. Yeah. At what point does the pendulum swing? And I don't want to say you get blasé about that stuff, no. about meeting your heroes, but you learn to deal with it and you, it becomes part of your life it's just familiarity a big one for me was going to new zealand in 2001 and doing this thing uh, with neil finn and anyway the first time we did it it was eddie vedder johnny marr sebastian steinberg lisa germano philip and myself and tim finn and neil obviously so i'd never met johnny before and johnny kind of was like the holy grail the guitarists for me I love the Smiths. And so I remember, and, and Neil said, Johnny's going to come and play. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> oh my God. And I'm like, I was nervous about it. Anyway, so it's a long flight to New Zealand. I get on the plane and Johnny's there with his wife, Angie. And Johnny comes and sits next to me and he's rabbiting. And we become like great friends since then. Because he treated me like an equal. You know, he was post Smiths, post the the post-electronic at that stage, he'd gone out with the healers, so he's kind of starting again, and I guess Radiohead were kind of quite at a high point then. And um, what was lovely was he was able to talk, and he said this, and he said he was able to talk about the Smiths and the stuff because he had enough distance about stuff that went on that he hadn't been able to necessarily talk about with somebody who'd been in a band because 
you know, basically the, the dysfunctionality of bands. Mm. There's a beauty to bands, but all bands are dysfunctional. And I think there's, if you understand that, it's not like you're bitching or you're, you're having a moan, but if you're with somebody who understands it, then you're just kind of, it's almost like you have to get it out. It's a reality. It's yeah. interesting because I've spoken to Johnny quite a few times over the years and I can't remember why, how we got onto it, but he said when the Smiths were splitting up, the first person to get in touch with him was McCartney. Yeah. And McCartney said, working on this record, solo record, will you come and help me out on it? Yeah. And McCartney ended up having that kind of chat, whether it was intentional or not, with yeah. Johnny. And it was a kind of thing of saying, you know what, it'll be all right. Um, and I think for Johnny as well, it was interesting because I think he still felt like a lot of the Smiths fans were still angry at him for splitting up the Smiths. And I was like, listen, I'm the biggest Smiths fan. We weren't angry. You know, I wasn't angry. You've done great things. You had to do other stuff. Mm. You've been quite upfront um, I over the years about talking about how you deal with mental health, about issues that you face, yeah. depression and things like that. Yeah. There's some quotes saying that Johnny helped you out yeah, he at did. one stage as well. He really helped me out. I mean, he helped me out in terms of kind of just by saying you're all right, you know, giving me some love. And around that time, and it was a really important time for me because I was suffering de from depression and I didn't really realize it. And I went down to New Zealand and it was kind of like my head's my head lifted above the clouds and I was just like, oh my God, this is how I can feel. And so I went back and that was a moment. So 2001, when I, day one of the rest of my life, I, start, I stopped drinking and Johnny was very good. He gave me this amazing book called The Perennial Philosophy by Old Jules Huxley, um, a collection of all the old texts, sacred texts, basically about the world of spirituality. The first time I read it didn't make sense. And then there was a moment in my life when, you know, about a year later, I started re reading and it was like, bang, this is exactly what I need to read. So like one of the greatest musicians was also one of the greatest human beings. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you think that, you know, you have to be of an, a bit of an ass to be a, a, a creative. And Johnny is like a light. It's like He's the no, antithesis to that, completely. isn't he? Completely. Let's play another song. What are we going to play next, Ed? The Beatles, Please Please Me. Yes. And the reason I chose this was because really my first musical awakening was with the Beatles. Like really, like age seven or eight. And I remember hearing Please Please Me and I just thought, this was the best music I'd ever heard living But I now. think this goes back to what you were saying earlier about a song can take you back to a certain period yeah. of your life. So yeah. this is this is what, what would have got uh, Ed O'Brien excited as a five-year-old kid. Yeah, totally. This is Please Please Me by The Beatles. We're doing the five best songs on Apple Music. We've got one more song to go. Uh, thank you, Ed, for coming in. Can you still imagine with Radiohead, the thing that blows my mind actually is that you've been a band now for over three decades mm. and we've all seen the Metallica documentary and we've all read, you know, interviews with bands and we all know the cliches about splitting up. It hasn't happened to Radiohead. No. You still seem as tight now as you were when you first went into the rehearsal room in 1985. You've kept it together. Do you think that it will continue forever? Because you've obviously cracked some code. You know how to make it good. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think one of the strengths of we've always kind of been is is our honesty. We'll make a record, we'll make records when we want to make records. When you make an album, you have to be inspired to make a record. And I think what's been great is whenever we've made an album, we've been inspired to make it. We haven't made it to fulfill some kind of contractual obligation. We've made it because there's been a pull. So I think Radiohead is will always be open-ended, will always it's always potential to do stuff. And I think that we've got an audience there who last tour we played, we did different sets each night. Yeah. You have to establish the fact that you're not going to play Paranoid Android every night. It's really important. As soon as that starts to feel a chore, you, you, you change. And one of the things, you know, for instance, live-wise, the set list is written that day. And it's written when we get in, after lunch, Philip, Tom and I would sit down and we do the set list. And that's based on entirely how you feel. What I'd like to do is actually, what usually happens on a tour is you actually get down to about 65 songs and it doesn't feel enough. It'd be great to have about 120. Wow. It's very hard as a musician to do the same set. And believe me, we've, there were times when it felt like we were a bit of a jukebox. But to be able to be released from that and to just play what you feel is right is so, is so important. Do you think that now that because you have had these periods so openly people know that it's not worth pushing you yeah me in my position now saying when are we going to get a record yeah. when are we get because 
it doesn't come like that. It's no. like when <laughs> when it feels right, we'll do it, and you'll get it. You'll yeah. hear it. Yeah. It'll happen naturally. And also, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter. I think it matters. Yeah, well, <laughs> here's the thing. I think the important thing is taking the pressure off because you take the bigger picture. Like, yes. it doesn't matter that the Beatles never made another record after Abbey Road. There's so many, there's so much beautiful music. And, and I'm not saying it won't happen. It, I'm, it will happen. But by also saying there's a potential for it not to happen takes the pressure off as well. You know, if you've been a band for 35 years, the band that you were at the beginning and the middle and where you have been in the last five years has to be different because you have to keep moving. I always find in Radiohead's history when Kid A comes around and suddenly Tom effectively is leading the band down this path. Yeah. Uh, Boards of Canada, Aphex Twin, yeah. very big influences. And suddenly it's not about traditional guitar, bass and drums. Yeah. I imagine there was definitely a period of head scratching. On my part, I was just like, yeah, what do I do? It's like anything, when you, again, you're out of the comfort zone, which is a good place to be, you look at music in a different way, what you can do collectively, but also what you can do individually and how you make sounds. So it was it was an interesting time because I remember we all, we all arrived at Kid A with all kind of like different, I remember Colin and I were listening to a lot of Scott Walker. I was thinking like, wouldn't it be amazing to make kind of record like this? And then Tom arrived with Aphex, Otecra, Boards of Canada. It was quite jarring at first, but I think quite quickly, because we the, the sessions that we initially tried didn't really work out in a kind of traditional band sense. That's not working. And I, and, and then it was a case of trying to discover what would work. We you know, were in the studio for over a year, on and off. It's one of the great stories of recording an album, really, I think. 20 yeah. years this year, isn't it? 20 I think, years, I think. Believe. Ed O'Brien, five best songs on Apple Music. Yeah. This has been a great track. We have a final song which yeah. we're going to play now. Talking of intense music and also music which comes from a stable, yeah. if you will, uh, when you talk about Motown and Hitsville, USA, you yeah. can't fail to mention Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Which song are we going to play by Marvin? Inner City Blues, off What's Going On. With. It was for a long time my favourite ever album. Listening to records like that gave us license to really push the boat out on OK Computer because you realise there's a bigger picture here, even if it wasn't like the record you'd done before. Because, you know, when OK Computer, before people were like expecting us to do the Benz part two and it wasn't. And it's very easy in hindsight to go, oh, yeah, but but it, it took some people a f couple of listens to get their heads around OK Computer, expecting it to be one thing and it's completely something else. And to have the confidence to make a record that needed maybe two or three listens to open itself up to you felt like the, the right move and what's going on does that. Ed O'Brien, what an amazing track to end with in the five best songs on Apple Music. Marvin Gaye, let's play it now. Uh, Inner City Blues, this is it. Uh